All right, everybody, welcome back to day two of the Trailline Conference. We're super excited to be kicking things off with our very own uh, Ray from Trailline, who is our head trader um, and one of the traders I've learned an immense amount from over the past year or so. Uh, Ray, thanks so much for being here and welcome. Thank you. So uh, today I'll, I'll be going over the foundations of stock trading, but uh, to, to get started, um, I, I will sort of talk about myself a little bit. So let me know if you can see, see the About Me screen. Um, this is a question I get often and uh, a lot of people are curious. So uh, my background is in electrical engineering. I have you know, a bachelor's and a master's. So a lot of my trading and how I go about things are influenced by that. And a lot of what I do in the markets is it comes straight from you know a very mathematical, rigid, but flexible approach uh, that I've developed for myself in the market. Uh, the other thing <clears throat> is, <clears throat> is I'm the co-founder of uh, TraderLine and DeepView, which, we'll, which I'll talk about throughout this presentation, uh, near the end of this presentation. And uh, a shout out to my mentors, uh, Ross Haber, who is also a co-founder of TraderLine, has had a big influence on how I trade and how uh, I manage my money today. And then the other shout out that I want to give is Mike Webster. So Mike Webster has been a, a big influence with his IBD courses early in my career. Uh, and when I started out as a trader and really uh, took me from that, you know, the, the boom and bust or the unprofitable stage to, to a consistent, you know, profitable trader. So, and the last one is the market. The market is really going to be your best mentor in any situation. You could listen to what others are saying. You could absorb what they're saying. You could try to mimic what they're doing, but that real experience that you build is going to come from the market itself when it, you know, it gives you an ass whooping or it teaches you a lesson how you take that in and how you incorporate that into you know your those learnings and how you get better from those so there's really no better mentor than real life experience in the market day in and day out to make sure that you know you absorb that and you're receptive to that feedback you're getting from the market so that's a little bit uh, about me uh, to get started we'll go one back just to cover the agenda so the topic i, I really want to discuss today is the foundation of stock trading. So what makes all these traders, Dan Zanger, uh, Mark Minervini, Oliver Kell, any of the US investing championships, William O'Neill, Jesse Livermore, what makes them successful? What is the common thread and how did, it, how did they achieve what they achieved in the markets? So we'll start out with phases, which I'll break down into three different stages that a trader goes through. And many of us don't see that stage three, but how can we get to that stage three? How can we develop a framework, a foundation of what, you know, what, what, what we're doing day to day? Uh, and that would be my, my uh, next topic, the foundation. Then we'll go over ruthless mastery, which is how do we focus on the right things in the market to get from that stage two trader to that stage three, study the markets, habit, routines, lifestyle. And then I'll share three setups that I use on a day-to-day -day basis, and then I repeatedly execute uh, upon those three setups to see a higher equity curve from what, one year to the next year. So evolution of a profitable trader. So stage one, uh, and, and you could, you know, in the YouTube comments, probably put what stage, you know, you're in at the moment, but stage one is all about you, you have the small wins and you have these larger losses that take you out and you see these lower lows on your equity curves. Uh, and you're, you're, you may be good at identifying a trade. You may be, you know, uh, good at, you know, seeing these small spurts uh, in your EC, but then you give it all back because you don't listen to what the market is saying. And that's really what stage one is about. You're stuck in this downtrend on your equity curve. Really the equity curve is what tells you, are you making money or are you not making money in the markets? Then we have stage two, where you have, you know, you, you, you're starting to figure out as the market teaches you lessons, you're starting to absorb that information. You're actually receptive to that information and you're trying to minimize your losses in the market after you have these big wins. And that's what I call the, the boom and bust. So we have these good areas where the market is with us. We have an edge we execute upon. But the problem is we keep giving it back because we, we're still not there. We're still building a little bit of experience. We're, we're good at identifying trades, but we're not good at, uh, you know, saying enough is enough in the market. The wind has changed uh, and, and we need to adapt. So this stage is all about 
you, you, you know that you're almost there, but you're not really there. And then this is stage three where you minimize your drawdowns and you see higher lows in what you're doing. So higher lows on your equity curve, you have larger wins you, you, where, where, you get, where you make money in large sums in a smaller amount of time. And then you have uh, time spans where you give back just a little and you know when to stop and you know when to you know, step aside and let the market be. And you're really receptive to the, what the market is doing. So how do we build a foundation that takes us from this stage one to if you're if you're stage one to a stage two and how do you move from stage two to stage three and I think these are really the four pillars um, it, it, for me uh, which is the EC mindset so the equity curve that we have and any major you know investing platform if you go you can see you know it draws you a line on a, on a day to day basis what does it look like have you made money have you not how is your equity curve trending for the year? And that insight is really the only insight that you need. That's the market talking to you and saying, whatever it is that you're doing, this is the result of it. So us being receptive to that will allow us to minimize our losses, to move from stage two to stage three or stage one to stage two. The second piece or the second foundation is what edge do you have in the market? Every trader, uh, you name it, you know, all these 27 speakers have some sort of edge in the market that they're executing upon again and again and again to, to, to be profitable, right? Because that's our goal is to be that stage three. Uh, we, and the third is entry tactics. Once you identify an edge on the chart, you know that you may have a technical edge, a fundamental edge, and you combine those two even better. Then it's about how do you enter that stock while minimizing your risk, right? That's a third piece of the puzzle that you have to put together. And the last one being position sizing. So when we go back and we say stage three traders, there are larger wins and smaller losses. The, the meat on the bone right there is if you don't position size well and you don't make a deliberate effort to position size big when the market is behind you, you're not gonna see those large wins and smaller losses and step aside or lower your position size when the market's not you know, with us anymore. So that last piece of the puzzle is really important that sort of ties in the EC mindset, the edges and the ed entry tactics that you deploy in the markets and, and position sizing dictates performance. And I want you guys to probably write this down is because without that, there's no way you're going to perform. If you put on 5% positions because you're scared of the market, that means you don't have a definitive edge or you're not confident in it, or you don't have entry tactics that you, you, know, you have supreme confidence in them so that you can go out there and size positions at 15%, 17% to make those large wins and then step aside and make smaller losses in the market as stage three traders. So one of the questions uh, I guess I wanna ask everybody, I guess in the comments you could put is, is what is our ultimate you know, goal? If you agree with this, you could say, you know, make money, probably type in a one or something. And if you disagree with it, you could type in a two and say, you know, our goal is not to make money. So. One of the things, you know, a lot of traders, uh, when they come in and they're focused on this, I want to make money, I want to do this, I want to make sure, you know, in three years, I have everything figured out, or it may be a couple of months, depending on the environment in the market where we think we could do really, really well. You know, a lot of traders that started in 2020 thought, they, you know, they have figured it out and, and they're ready to go in about one to three months. But I disagree with that. So the common thread from stage one to stage two and from stage two to th stage three is how do we stop losing money in the markets? If we focus on that aspect or keep an, you know, the way we view the markets from that aspect is that if we minimize loss as a stage one trader, you're losing money in the markets. What is it that is making you lose money? Is it a lack of edge? Is it a lack of entry tactics? Is it, is it a lack of poor position sizing? So you're sizing small when the market's good or you're sizing big when the market's poor. We have to focus on why is it that we're losing money in the markets itself? So if we keep going uh, with, so if, if we take a look at stage one, if we focus on what's causing this drawdown and we focus on what's causing this drawdown and, it, and our really our goal is to minimize that drawdown so that we can see higher lows on our equity curve, that is what's going to result in a better performance over a span or a series of trades. And a lot of traders tend to get you know, hung up on 
I just want to, you know, keep making money. And that's my only goal. But our really our goal is how do we figure out, you know, filter out all our mistakes as much as much as we can continuously improve upon what we're learning and the feedback that we're getting in the market so that we could be stage three. So let's cover the first um, pillar or the foundation of what makes a successful trader. Um, we have to associate the way we see the market with, you know, if there's no ego involved, it's market giving us feedback that your system's working. And that's when we see these spikes, right? Now the spikes tell, spikes tell us that the market is behind us, whatever edge entry tactic and position sizing we're deploying is working. And when the market tells you it's time to stop, you step aside and you let it be so that you can go sideways. And then again, you know, you, you, you identify when the market's good, you have an edge entry tactic and you position size it well, you'll see another spike and you try to repeat that in a loop. Now, this is really the, the dream scenario right here is to see some, some equity curve like this. There are going to be instances where you give it all back. There are going to be instances where you're frustrated and you undercut the prior low of your equity curve. There are going to be uh, instances where you run into a news event and, and you, your EC gaps down. All those are perfectly normal, but the bigger picture, if you were to zoom out and take a look at everything uh, from one year to next, from one, year one to year five, are you seeing that, that progress that, that you want to see in the markets? And that's really the EC mindset is to minimize that loss in the market so that you could be a profitable trader. It's a very different way of view, view, uh, viewing things. It's a very different way of looking at the market and, and it's for the better. Uh, and I think this is what success, you know, all successful traders are doing. The second one that I want to talk about, and I think is very important, is operating on an edge. If you're not operating or you don't have a definitive edge that you've studied in the markets, then what is it that you're trying to you know, constantly and repeatedly execute upon? If you don't have clarity on, on what you, you, know, you know and you've studied and you have conviction in and you can position size well, if you don't have something like that in the markets, then what are you executing upon and what foundation have you laid for yourself so that you can be, a you know, you can move from a stage two to stage three. Traders that are good, for example, Oliver Kell with the, you know, when we did the swing trading master class, he knows, uh, for example, the patterns or things that he's looking for. He knows that when he sees breath coming up the right side, he's going to size them up and, and well, he knows that, okay, the 200 DMA might be important to this process because institutions might be looking at that at a long-term level. So what edge do you have and what are you operating upon? And that's the common thread. Every trader or every successful trader has an edge and they're repeatedly executing upon that edge to draw an income from the market. So that is, is, is one of the things that you have to have clarity about and, and really know, uh, you know, ha ha just, have have immense amount of examples that, that that you can see visualize look at historically in the markets and then when you see it real time you you're you're reacting or, or you're you know you're executing upon those rather than rather than thinking or questioning yourself so first when you're looking for for an edge what are the winning characteristics so if we go out and study the history of the market you could do a 20-year study on the pc ratio you could do a 20-year study on any particular indicator or data point that, that you could come across. And you can see that any data point in the market has a particular time that it works. And there, there's a particular time that it doesn't work. In the recent markets, when we're in a bear market, for example, the put call ratio might not be as effective because it's a different type of market. The Fed's not with us and we're you know greater than 20% off the highs. So going back in time, studying that and finding the common threads where, when it works, when it doesn't work, will, will allow you to identify that edge and you'll know exactly when you should be executing upon it in different market environments. And point three I want to make is it has to be self-study. I can tell you when the put call works. Uh, I can, you know, uh, Patrick Walker can tell you when the higher low setup is working like he did yesterday. But if you don't go out and study it for yourself, if you don't go out and visualize, if you don't go out and look at charts and make sure that, you know, it's really you doing all the work, then it's not going to work at the end of the day. You can have mentors, you can have anybody on the face, you know, this planet Earth tell you something, but the real doing is actually going, you know, getting your hands dirty and actually 
um, you know, go, doing the work itself. You can watch videos. You could, we could do everything. Go, you know, read textbooks. But the real, you know, get your hands dirty and actually study the market for yourself so that you can build convic conviction. So the the third, uh, you know, sort of the foundation that I want to cover is entry tactics. So once you have an edge in the markets, how do you deploy that edge and how do you enter the markets so that you can exploit it and make it, a, you know, make that edge a source of income? And there are a few key points. So we have to focus on our risk, risk and reward. It's very easy to say, but based on that edge and, and what you've studied historically about it, what makes it, you know, what's the optimal entry area for you to get in, minimize your loss at the same time so that you could execute upon it again and again while not, you know, giving back a lot of uh, cash. So you must be in the driver's seat and you must build confidence in that entry tactic. If you don't, if you have an edge and you haven't, studied exactly how you get in you know how do you how do you execute upon it it really doesn't matter because it's not going to you know it's not going to bleed into confidence and confidence allows you to perform in the markets at the end of the day so when when you have an entry tactic you've defined very you know and we'll get into very specific details later on in this presentation what you're doing is you're exploiting an edge and then you're saying this is what i've seen historically works best within my time frame within my system and then you repeatedly uh, exploit that so that you could, you know, be, be a profitable stage three trader in the markets. And the last one, probably the most important one, if our goal is to perform and, you know, extract an income and be a stage three trader with large wins and smaller losses, position sizing dictates that. You have to make a deliberate effort to look at position sizing. You have to make a deliberate effort to, to make it a point of emphasis, maybe have a sticky note that I have to position size well for me to have any success in the market. That when Oliver is putting, he's not putting on two and a half percent positions. Mark Mitrovini is not putting on a one percent position. They're putting on massive positions when they see ed, see, when they see an edge in the market and they have an entry tactic that they could employ, right? A higher low setup. If you study hundreds and thousands of thousands of those that and that's your edge in the market and you know exactly that you're supposed to enter above the prior days high and you've seen that again and again you visualize it then you could position size it well so that you could actually extract the income taking two percent positions three percent positions makes sense for for a hundred million dollar hedge fund or a 200 million dollar hedge fund or a billion dollar uh hedge fund but it does not make sense when you have a retail account and you're trying to grow it quickly by repeatedly executing upon it. So how do you position size, right? That's, that's one of the things that, you know, everybody seems to, to have a question about. How do we do it well? And, I, and this is how I really break it down for myself. How many edges do I have on that particular chart? And how many entry tactic, you know, what entry tactic am I gonna deploy? And, and ha have I seen success with the entry tactic in the past? When I combine these two, it will yield me position size. It will tell me that am I supposed to be sizing it up versus another name, or am I not supposed to be sizing it up as, as much? So what that means is if we want to see those large wins and small losses, those poorer names will have lesser edges and smaller position sizes. And the ones that are really, you know, have everything going, the, the market, the group, and the, the edge on the chart itself, and everything is pointing in one direction, those are the ones I want to size up because probabilities tell me that the probabilities of success for those names is much higher and I should be sizing them much higher. Now, if we, if we do this on a consistent basis, we'll have large wins and smaller losses. The poor setups will get lower position sizes. The better setups will get higher position sizes. And naturally, the math will work so that you see a higher EC on your portfolios. So let's go to the next slide. So how do you, how do, you do all this, right? It's, it's easy to talk about it. It makes sense. It's really, you know, uh, it makes sense from, you know, looking at it, studying other traders, but how do they actually go about doing what they're doing? One of the first keys is deliberate visualization and charting. So when you speak to Mike Webster, there, he's done studies with thousands of charts He's gone back and studied hundreds of different situations. He's, you know, documented what he's doing on a daily basis, weekly basis, or a yearly basis. And that's what they're doing. They're, 
training their eyes to see winners in the market. And, and that training really never ends. It's deliberate visualization that continuously happens pretty much every single day the market's open. And then if you run that over a span of five, 10 and 15 years, you could start to trade on, which is point number two here. You start trading on subconscious. You, you can connect one situation to a prior situation. You're, you develop an instinct that now it's, you know, it's time to go, 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 or it's time to just be, you know, slide back because I don't feel comfortable in the situation. And I feel this point is very important because there, there's a lot of trading that is done based on feel. It can't, you can't really describe it, but you could see that this is, you've been in a situation before, you, you know that, okay, this reminds me of this and I should size it well. When, you, when you're making that split second decision to, to put on a large position and you think that everything's gone well, it's, it's that deliberate visualization coming, you know, coming into your subconscious and you develop a feeling and instant that now, now it's time to go. So the third point is emotions. There's a, there's a certain level of emotion that, you know, you can only tame so much or you could be, uh, you know, a, a dead bird in the market, but that, that's not how things work. You have to, emotions are part of the game and, and you'll feel a certain type of way when you're doing things that have worked for you in the past and you'll feel a little bit iffy and, and you want to step back a little in certain situations, but you take a position anyway. So convert your emotions into an edge. And I think the best way especially if you're year one to seven and 10 is to write it down to see, you know, tell yourself how you feel, let it all out on a piece of paper so that you could convert your emotions into an edge in the market. So that is something that you could do. It doesn't have to be a lab, you know, crazy good. And you have a dedicated notebook and you journal it, all that fancy stuff. As long as you let it out and you could write it out, you know, this is what I did in this situation, you'll develop, uh, you know, you'll you'll see how you can convert emotions uh, into an edge. The fourth one is connecting states. So if human psychology has remained the same and we're still, you know, uh, fairly good <laughs> or, uh, you know, the same humans that we were about 100 years ago, it, based on that fact, we will act in a similar manner. So if you go back and study the markets on a historical basis, the patterns that we see on a technical or fundamental basis will still apply to the current markets. Right. So if history is to teach us something, we can connect our current state. So, for example, right now, the, the big talk is the Fed is you know raising rates and all that. If you go back and study the markets, this has happened before. You could develop that into an edge. You can say this is what happened in past instances that this is likely to happen in the future. And if it doesn't, I'm still going to be prepared for that other, you know, the alternative scenario. But this is the likely scenario. And we could if you function upon that you'll have far more conviction, far more confidence, and then confidence yields performance. If you don't show up every day and you're not confident in what you're doing, you're not going to perform well. And that's a big part of uh, what I call ruthless mastery. The, the other aspect of it, and we'll zoom in a little bit, is how do you study the markets, right? And there's really four things that, that you want to be doing. It, what what it depends on what you're studying and the edge you, you know you take up and you have to go and really take a look at on, on a bigger sample set what is happening if you want a definitive and true edge in the markets what do we how can you build confidence in that and the only common way that i've seen that i've you know studied all these successful traders is they go back and they look at a thousand examples they chart them out, they build binders, and they, you know, literally colored copies of examples written out and so that they can, you know, again, visualize what they see. That's the only way you will get better. It's not reviewing a thousand charts from another trader. It's not looking at a thousand charts from another trader. It's you doing it yourself and collecting those examples for yourself that will allow you to train your eye to do what those successful traders are doing. As much as we want to follow, as much as we want to you know, take shortcuts without training our instinct, our, you know, our decision-making power, the way we view the markets and the way we, you know, look at the markets, that only comes from you doing deliberate work when you're at the desk and becoming a subject matter expert. If you aren't an expert at the edge that you deploy in the markets, if you aren't an expert at the entry technique that you deploy in the markets, you will not, again, you will not have confidence. And if you don't have confidence, you will not perform, uh, which is unfortunate. So study the markets, 
for yourself, do it yourself, and have definitive examples. And I'll cover some of the ones that I deploy uh, shortly. So the last bit of it, um, I feel there's there's some sort of notion or this, there's some perception that to be a good trader, you have to be at the desk 14 hours a day and you have to sacrifice your lifestyle. Uh, and and I believe, you know, to, to, to consistently perform what we're paid to make decisions and, and, and we're paid to have, you know, this is a performance sport. It's not one that if you if you stay at the desk at 14 hours is going to guarantee you any money. There's no guarantees in this game. So lifestyle is very important to what we're doing. You have to balance. You have to, you know, if you if you have a personal matter, you have to step away from the markets. You can't have your one eye on the market and one eye somewhere else because that is going to allow, you know, you'll step, a, step on a landmine. You, you know, you'll have a drawdown. You'll get frustrated. You'll go into, you know, back from being a stage two to a stage one or a stage three to a stage two trader. So balance a lot. You know, there's no, nobody successful is sitting here 18 out of 20 out for hours trying to trying to make it happen that is not how things work you need the, you know your brain and, and, the, and the thing you know in, in, you know in the middle of your head to, to really uh you know you, you, we're 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 basically we're we're paid to perform right so the, the second one is your personal life if you don't have a positive mindset you have something you got into, into a fight with your spouse or something that has happened outside of trading, leave that, step away from the markets, take time away. It's better than losing money, which is, all, again, it's going to you know, ruin your psyche. It's going to ruin your mindset as well. So this first point, at, when you arrive at the desk, if the market opens at 930 and you're, and you're arriving at, say, 8 o'clock or 730, you should have a deliberate routine. I think good traders have a very focused routine when it's game time. So they do the same things on a daily, weekly basis to prepare for the markets. And they do the same thing as the market opens or as they're coming in to the open. So be very clear about your routines that are market related so that you can have a balanced lifestyle. So, for example, when the market closes at, um, you know, four o'clock and two, two o'clock uh, mountain time for Eastern, uh, you should have a clear picture on what you have to do to prepare for the next day. It's not to sit there for five, six hours, just dwelling over what happened. It, you should have a, you know, I have to run this, these particular scans. I have to make these particular notes. I have to review these particular things in the market for me to, you know, execute the next day. So be very deliberate about your daily routines, your weekly routines, your quarterly and your yearly. So if you have a focused approach and a clear approach, it will allow you to get those routines done and you can have a balanced lifestyle. A balanced lifestyle will allow you to perform better in the markets because when you come back to the desk, you'll be very fresh uh, and, and you'll be making decisions that positively impact your equity curves. And it looks like we... Now we'll talk about basically the three setups. So enough of that, you know, general talk uh, that not, you know, I know people are here for examples and, you know, sort of specifics. So, the three setups that I employ are launch pads that I'll talk about with examples. The second one being the high volume edge and the third one being relative strength. These are very, you know, very basic setups, but these are sort of the foundations of how I trade. If I see these setups, I, you know, I have hundreds of examples, thousands of examples on each of these, and I just execute upon them because I've built instinct and I've built, you know, a entry tactic to, to deploy consistently in a position size and well so that I could be a stage three. So the first example we'll get into right here is uh, Coupa Software back in 2018, right around the end of 2018, early 2019. So I've deliberately not written down the specific criteria for launch pads. I feel uh, that, you know, when I, when you do that, a lot of traders tend to think, uh, you know, how do I make this into an indicator? And they really lose the point of, of what we're trying to you know, teach. So the launch pad setup, and you can write this down if you want, is the 10 day, 21 day, and the 50 day being one to 3%, uh, you know, being, being as close as one to 3% uh, to each other. So that the price on a 10 day basis, price on a 21 day basis, and price on a 50 day basis is one to 3% from each other. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that 
that volatility is starting to dampen, right? If price is closing in a similar zone on a 10, 21, and 50-day basis, it means we've built out a really solid sideways base. And when that happens is what we call, you know, it's time to get directional in the markets. Either the stock is going to move up from that direction, it's going to get volatile, right? From, from contraction, uh, you know, from a contraction pattern, you get volatility to the upside or you get volatility to the downside. So we know that we're going to get a directional move with the launch fed setup. So this back in uh, 2019 built out a launch fed where price on a 10, 21 and 50 day basis was within one to 3% and the stock closes above all the key moving averages. Once we have that, we basically have our launch fed set up. That is something that you can look for consistently in the markets. That is happening at the moment as well. As we see some of the right sides coming up, we're see, starting to see launch bats form uh, in many of these names. And when that happens, you could deploy an entry tactic, which could be as simple as a declining top line, the, the group being on fire. There are a bunch of launch bats in the same group. And now you have the group behind you. The, if the market gets going, then you have the market behind you. So this gray line is the S&P 500. The market is rising. The, 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 the stock has formed a launch pad. Now you have an entry tactic. You deploy that and you're, you're functioning on a vision. You know, you're visualizing this because you've seen this 100, 200, 300, and 500 times in the past. And we get a good move out of that particular setup. So we'll go over another example. So this is a CA Chegg the, back in, I think, 2020 or early, uh, yeah, early 2020. It was the same thing. We built out, you know, the COVID correction. The RS line is going up. It's trying to exhibit or, uh, you know, or buck the market trend. We see all the moving averages, the 10, 21, and the 50 move in close proximity of each other. That means, you know, it's rounded out a fairly solid base and it's ready to get volatile. Volatility could be to the upside or the downside in the markets, right? So, and, and, and when the stock confirms that move and closes above, all the key moving averages, that's what you can execute upon. And this one I remember well because Ross had it on his top 10 report uh, and it ended up gapping up and we built up enough cushion uh, back in 2020 to, to, to get into this gap up. So that's one of the setups that you could deploy in the market. It happens every time. If a group is trying to turn from a corrective state, they will always, or for the most part, always exhibit this particular characteristic, which we call the launch bed. Now, everybody wants an indicator, right? Because they, uh, they don't want to see it on the charts. They just want something to you know, do it for them. So if you scan this particular uh, QR code, you, it will take you to our trading view page. And this particular indicator just specifically marks out every time the 10, 21, and the 50 day are within one to 3% of each other. It will give you a visual clue that a launch pad might be building. So you could take this. You could go back historically and study this uh, on TradingView, and you'll see this again and again on some of the biggest winners in the market as they build out proper basis. They, you know, you see volatility contraction. You could figure out an entry tactic, and really, you could collect a thousand examples of these, build conviction, self confidence, and then execute upon it in the markets. I could go and you know go through fifty other examples, but. The real doing is you doing it for yourself. You looking at it and making sure that you built a visual memory so that you could succeed in the markets. Now, the second one is the high volume edge. So the high volume edge is basically something has happened in the markets where the stock is gapping on. It could be the highest volume ever. So it's the highest volume the stock has ever seen. It could be the highest volume in over a year. So from one earning cycle to the next, the stock is now exhibiting massive volume and it, and it, and it qualifies as the highest volume in a year. The, the other one being it's the highest volume since IPO. So it, the stock has IPO'd and, and reports earnings or some news. And now the, the candlestick and the volume that you get that uh, is the highest since it's IPO day. So how do I come up with all of these? This deep, the way you come up with them is you go and study how do successful IPOs act? How do they double, triple, and, and then some? And you'll, you'll see a common thread that Facebook back in 2004 or five did the same thing. It was down, you know, beaten down just like Snapchat, Twitter back in the day when the market was favorable for those stocks. And how did they come out of that? They exhibited this 
very particular characteristic, which was the highest, they had the highest volume since IPO, the reported earnings, there was some favorable news or, or something that caught the market off guard or some new information that came out and it was visible accumulation on the charts. It was so exciting that the institutions could not hide it, right? So, and, and that is one of the edges I deploy. Now there might be, you know, over the years, if I keep studying and the market changes and I have to look for a different type of HV edge, then you add that to your toolbox or your arsenal and, and you keep developing or incrementally improving upon that over a span of years. So one thing I wanna make sure like, at first I would always look at highest volume ever or highest volume uh, in a year. When I studied IPOs, I added highest volume since IPO. So a lot of these come from your, you know, you have to study the markets to improve your edge uh, in the market itself. So let's, uh, let's dive into an example here. So Twilio, for example. So this particular gap up back in May, 2020, uh, Twilio reported earnings uh, has a you know a massive gap up in price. The closing range on that particular day is greater than 50%. The volume that we see on that day is the highest volume in a year. That is telling me that there are institutions that are piling in to this particular name. And that is an edge, or that is something that I've seen in the past. So if, if it's something that I've seen in the past, the probabilities of it working in the future, if human emotions have you know not changed over a span of a century, then the probabilities of me extracting a profit out of this particular name are high. So we get follow on follow through volume the next day, the entry tactic that we deploy or I deploy is what I call the HVC, uh, which is the highest volume close when price moves through that highest volume close and the high of the prior day, I can enter that stock and I'm looking for instant momentum at that point so that I can build a cushion in the name right away. And then if it were to pull back in, I could sit back and look at it from a larger perspective and say that, okay, there's a lot of accumulation and I expect whoever bought in this area to come back and scoop up some more right here so that we could keep trending higher. Now, we don't want to isolate or, or have, you know, a tunnel vision that something's got the highest volume in over here and has to work. The market, the group, the, you know, the, the Fed policy all come into play and allow you to, you know, allow this stock to keep going from where it started. But it all starts from this highest volume in over a year. If you start tracking those you know, over a span of you know, one to three months, one to eight months, you'll develop an instant and, and feel for these names and how they perform uh, from these particular you know, visible accumulation uh, on the charts. The second example is UPSD. This one's uh, one that everybody's familiar with and one that you know, had massive gains in 2020, we see these three day, you know, big runs, but the common thread that would tie all of these runs is the fact that this was the highest volume since IPO day. Now, if this is the highest volume since IPO day, there's something that has happened on that particular day. Uh, it might be news, it might be, you know, it doesn't really matter, upgrades, uh, um, someone came out and said they bought stock, this person took a position, blah, blah, blah. There's really, no, it doesn't really matter what it is, but it's exhibiting that particular edge or that characteristic that we're looking for in the markets. And then you could deploy the HVC, which is when the price goes through that highest volume close, you place your stops tightly. Maybe you take a one to 2% stop, or maybe, you know, some traders take three to 5%. Uh, and depending on the character of the name, you adjust accordingly. And then you can extract a possible income in a very short span of time. So this is a 30% run in about three days, 104% and 119 I'm not here to say that you will extract the full 119%. What I'm trying to show you is there's some potential out of that 104%, maybe you extract 20, 30% of that move or, or, so that you can you know, make progress on your account. So there's no guarantees that you'll catch the full run, but you could be part of that run so that you could continue making progress in your accounts. The third one is a recent one. Uh, I didn't want to keep them all to, to pre-2020. Because uh, that would be, you know, fool's gold at that point. But this one again, LNTH. This particular year, we saw a gap up right above the thirty-five dollar mark. We saw, you know, a good closing range, and this volume was the highest volume in a year. Now, this at this point, right about on this day, this should be on your radar. You could go study this, the you know, the story of it, why it happened. They report positive earnings, whatever the case might be. But there's a reason that you want to be tracking this, and that reason is volume. 
if the reported a positive story it gapped up and it had poor volume, the probabilities of it failing over are far higher because there's no accumulation on that chart. The fact that we see the highest volume in a year tells us that there's visible accumulation, there's institutional interest in this particular name, and that's the reason we want to be tracking it. And that's really the essence of the HB edge that we have in the markets. Then we see follow on follow through volume. So the entry tack that you could deploy is the HBC area. It comes above that and the high of the prior day, and you get instant momentum out of that area where the stock is not making any excuses, right? And then this one has made about a 75% move uh, this year. It's been a bit of a grind and choppy in, in the way it trades, but the real momentum started from this, you know, gap and above this 35 spot, closing good, greater, you know, greater than 50% closing range, and then follow on follow through action right away. Someone saying, I have not had enough of this stock and I want more the very next day. The third one, I'll just grab some water here, Richard. So the third one is uh, the, the relative strength. This one, you know, everybody talks about it. Uh, it's fairly easy to spot, but I want, I want to show you guys something. Um, you know, how do we visualize it and how do we see it on the charts themselves? So the relative strength edge really tells us, you know, these are strong stocks that are trying to go against the market that are being accumulated by someone, some force in the market is accumulating it when the market is coming back in and sort of, you know, trashing everything else. And those are signs of accumulation. Someone has to come in and have enough interest for the stock and accumulate it. And there's only one force that could do that in the markets. And that is the institutions that really run the show on a net basis. So let's jump into an example and this is a very classic example. There's tons of examples from 2020, but this is not isolated to 2020. You can go back to 1990s, 1980s, 1970s, and you'll see the same sort of uh, pattern within the RS line. So we see the COVID market where, where market came in, and we see the RS line. So on a, on a relative basis to the S&P 500, Amazon is performing uh, quite well. Price was down here. We built a launch pad setup right about here. And I remember this being on Ross's top 10 as well. So we built a launch pad setup where the 10, 21, and the 50 day are in close proximity to each other. We have the relative strength line screaming. And now we have two edges that are going at once. And what that means is we have to, we could possibly increase our position size on this name. When you have multiple edges, like we discussed back a couple of slides ago, you have you know, you have the RS edge and then you have the launchpad set up. You combine those two. Now you can really size up this name to perform. This is how you have a large win in the markets uh, and, and you can really see an EC spike or an equity curve spike. So we see about a 50% move in a, you know, a short amount of time frame. And then you also have the market. We have our follow through days. Uh, the market goes back into an uptrend. We're above, you know, starting to reclaim the 21 day, the, the 50 day. And your market edge will also come into play that, okay, maybe above you have a, you, you know, you've studied the market versus the 50 uh, DMA, like Joe Fami referred to yesterday, and you've built that conviction that, okay, every time the market's above the 50 day, I should be sizing a little bit higher versus if the market's below the 50 day, I should not size as much. All those forces, when they're combined together, they, what they really yield is how much conviction and confidence or how much position size you're going to have in this name. And that is what will allow you to perform. And we have to be very, very deliberate about position sizing in the markets if we want to make this a, a solid source of income for us. The other example uh, that I want to point, point out here is AEHR. I, I really like to pay, you know, pay attention to these younger names or younger stories. And if you go study the market, it's something that is ending up, you know, has moved from five to, to $100 or 10 to, to, to $200. Um, th there's a common thread in those names as well. And, and I like to track some of the younger stocks as well because they can double and triple very quickly in the short uh, amount of time. So here what we have is, you know, the gray area is sort of showing that the market is declining and there's market pressure. And then this RS line is showing that AEHR it doesn't give a damn and it's continuously moving up. Uh, and and it, essentially this name went from about $5 to about $25 in the span of you know, less than uh, three months. 
So what is it that, that started the move? The first thing is the HV edge. This was the highest volume in over a year, and this was the highest volume ever. That is our first edge that we have. This is how you get it on your radar. The other one is, you know, you can look at is the criteria of 100% move in less than six weeks. That's your high tight flag type of setups, right? This is for you to execute upon these setups, you have to get them on your radar first. And if you scan for these particular characteristics, you have a chance, a very good chance or a slight chance, better than zero, to potentially catch something that is going to go from five and go up to 20. So we, we get our HV edge, we get this on our radar, but then we see massive relative strength as the market is coming in. This stock is continuously outperforming and, and seeing a rise in RS. And then you could identify your entry tactics. The one that I like is it, you know, the name when it, when it gets from $5 to $10, they tend to mature a little bit more. They get, get, tend to get a little more volume. The dollar volume rises. It's on more eyes and a lot more people see it. And then uh, I particularly enter this name right around the 10 area and, and caught a double. Did I catch the entire move from five to 20? No, I did not. But did I catch part of the move? That's really the only goal that we have uh, in the market. So the next one uh, example is a recent one that I wanted to cover is FNKO. So this is a weekly chart uh, in the markets. We see this recent drawdown in the S&P 500 this year. And this is a weekly chart of FNKO. It's built out this massive base. There are no guarantees that it's going to do this again, but it has shown uh, the ability to, to go from five to 27 in the past. And just maybe if it could survive the worst market conditions, it could go, you know, bust out of this bigger base that we're seeing at the moment and sort of double from here. Now, those are, again, all probabilities. We'll have to track how it acts if it builds, you know, a particular spot that we could, you know, really size up on. But this one has one of our edges, which is the relative strength line, screaming to new highs as the market conditions remain poor. The next one, the other one I want to point out is SWIR. It's very similar. The market is declining and, and remains under pressure and the stock continues to rise as we see an increase in weekly average volume as well, which is this blue uh, 20 MA line. So there's significant interest to accumulate this stock while the market, market moves down. So what, now we have one of our edges, which is the relative strength. If you go to the daily chart, this, this particular stock had the highest volume in over a year. That's your second edge. Now, if you combine those edges and wait for the market to be in an uptrend, the probabilities are going to align with what you're doing and the probabilities of success uh, are going to align and you can size this up really, really well if and when the market gets into a solid, solid uptrend. So that is four examples I had for the RS line. How are we doing for time? About in 57 minutes? Yeah, we're at about 50 minutes now. Okay, perfect. Yep. Um, so take, take, take all of these examples you know, find examples, go on TradingView. They have, you know, 100, uh, like 100 year worth of data. You can find launch pads. You can, you know, take screenshots, print them out, build a binder full of them. You could do the same thing with the high volume edge and you could do the same thing with rel relative strength. The more you visualize and deliberately do and get your hands dirty, the better it's going to be. And, and really me real mentorship comes from pushing people to do it on your own. It's not to create dependency and, 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 you know, you wake up and you sign into a portal and you make sure that, you know, uh, I want to know his thoughts or her thoughts. It's really you have to do it yourself. You have to exhibit that self-leadership. You have to go out there and, and do this for yourself. So some of the closing thoughts that I have uh, for my presentation. So one of the common things that I see traders uh, is that X indicator or X data point doesn't work. Everything, every indicator in the market is named by, you know, after someone that made it or did well in the markets. It's not, it's not, you know, Kelter's channels or DeMarc's pivots. All those people are profitable traders or did something positive that, that a lot, you know, that, that people follow. And, and every indicator has a point in time or time frame it works in. So even as something as simple as the RSI, if you want to make that part of your system and you go study it, I, I know, uh, you know, a trader that just looks at RSI greater than 90, runs a scan on it, has done a historical study. He wants to trade momentum in the markets. And all he does is RS greater than 90, volume greater than 100K. He, he's mastered that setup. So every data point works it, and it has its own time frame that it works in. 
The second one is nothing is new in the markets. If you look at it, you know, if you study it historically, but every moment is unique. And what I'm trying to communicate with that is basically you, you, you can't have just one certain scenario and you say, okay, with this HV edge, this has to work because I've seen it work. There's always probabilities that it won't work as well. So always have scenario A and scenario B that you're operating upon. There's no guarantees in the market. Third is failure is good and use it as a weapon to improve. So failure in the markets, the more you're receptive to it, the more you're you know, receptive to your losses, the more you look at your losses, the more that you look at your emotions, that's gonna allow you to improve and you could turn that into a weapon uh, as well. So failure is good, don't be down. You, you'll see, you know, year one to 10, you'll have moments where, where you will not do well and you'll have moments that you do really well bottle up those moments that you do really well and and look forward to those in your in, in bad times that's really what's going to get you uh you know going so the third the fourth is a, don't associate with outcomes or guarantees or things that you feel are, are always going to be you know work out for you try to place yourself in, in situations where you have the highest probability of winning if you could gather if you have if you can only trade well, if the market's above the rising 21 day and what Mike Webster can call a power trend, then do that. You want to place yourself in the highest, you know, have the highest probability of winning in your particular time frame and situation. Uh, the, the, the next one, you're going to have bad months, weeks, and years. You're, you're going to have times where you make no money for a span of three, four, five months. There are going to be times where you make so much money in the span of, uh, you know, five, six, or seven months that you don't know what to do with it. So you're going to have bad moments. You're going to have good moments. Focus on the bigger journey. Focus on the fact that you have you will continuously improve over a span of years and years uh, in this game, and that improvement will never end. You'll never be a finished product in this game. You have to focus on, you know, that that is really the journey of it is, is what's worth it. So the, the next one, never give up. A lot of traders try this uh, and they don't have a proper foundation with how they approach this and, and they end up you know saying that the market is it, just just like the casino you're just gambling and if you do good you do good you make it and if you don't uh, then so be it so that's really the key if you build a solid foundation this is doable you see people there are 27 speakers at this conference they have a legitimate track record. They've done it. They have edges and entry tactics that they operate upon. They repeatedly execute. It's possible. So never give up. The other one, focus on doing. A lot of what you're going to see and, and the success will not come from watching or taking someone else's watch list or looking at someone else's opinion. It's going to come from you doing your routines, doing your you know market habits, instead of consuming, internalizing and absorbing that information into how your system is going to be using it. So focus on doing, have a binder of, you know, with a setup and, and 100 charts printed out. I guarantee you, you'll be the subject matter expert on that particular setup and you'll trade it better than any market participant out there. And that's really what it's about. And then the last one is how do we extract an income? We extract an income if we repeatedly execute upon a definitive edge that we're confident in, and that is what a lot of these top triple digit performers are doing. They're looking for the same thing again and again and again in the markets, and they're repeatedly executing it with the biggest position size that they possibly can while managing their risk to, to be a stage three trader. So with that, I wanna close out with some of the projects and um, tell you guys about, you know, everybody knows about Trader Lion. Oops. My bad. So my project. So Trader Lion, we, we have, you know, very good courses uh, and a service, a mentorship service as well. So you can check out, you know, Oliver Kale's master class. We've partnered up with Stan Weinstein himself to teach the stage analysis course, like an updated, you know, sort of version. He wrote the, you know, the book that everybody knows about that's, you know, been around for decades now, uh, if you want to check that out. And a lot of interesting projects that we'll have on the trader line side. The goal is to help you move from that stage one, stage two to stage three. 
that is what we're really good at. And that is what, you know, I want to have an imprint where I build uh, hundreds and hundreds of traders to, to be stage three and really build that solid foundation in the markets. My other project that I've been working on for about a year uh, plus now uh, and, and really has been a dream of mine is, is uh, DeepView. So it's going to be an investing platform where you'll have fundamental data, technical data on a historical basis. Uh, it, it will be, it, you know, I want this to be a disruptor in the markets. I want this data to be as accurate as possible and it just works. So that is something that will be coming out this fall. We'll have a full fledged, you know, we'll start out with a screening uh, platform and then move to, you know, adding watch lists, dashboards, uh, alerts, uh, and, and what have you, and build out a full platform over the span of a year or two. So that is deep you and that will be coming out. Uh, this wall. So with that, Richard, I think we can open it up for questions. Perfect, Ray, and fantastic presentation. And uh, to kick things off, I think uh, this would be a good intro question to, to ask. Uh, it's something I love to to ask everybody who I interview, and and a bunch bunch of people uh, brought it up as well. Uh, so basically, what was you know the turning point in your trading for you over the course of your your career, and also uh, you can rephrase it: what what were some of your aha moments while trading? I would say my turning point was really looking at my my losses, so printing them out. And actually looking at what am I what am I doing wrong in the market? So that's really where I you know I turned it around. Um, you we all start out as stage one and stage two. There's no, you know, you don't start out as a stage three unless it's 2020. Uh, so when you start out as stage one and stage two, for the longest time, I would say for my first three, four, five years, I would ignore when I would lose money in the markets and I will be very, you know, I would only look at my wins. So looking at those losses is what, you know, printing them out, looking at, you know, why did I enter? Why am I doing what am I doing? You know, why am I doing what, you know, what's, what is going on that's causing me to lose money in the markets and really making a deliberate effort to just look at the losses. And I feel that is what turned, turned it around. The other one I would say is, you know, just mentorship from Ross himself or having conversations with experienced traders. I think that to an extent that is also very, very important because they've been through what you're going through right now. So uh, I think I was lucky in that regard to, to be surrounded by experience, to have you know uh, an outlet that not many traders are lucky to, to have uh, and have those conversations with them so that I could turn it around. So it's a combination of those two yeah, uh, for me. Perfect, perfect. And uh, there's also a few questions about, um, you know, when you do enter stock and are using those entry tactics are, here we go. Here's a question here from Dirk. Uh, basically, do you go in all at once with your full position size or do you kind of scale in like Patrick Walker uh, to use an example from, from basically yesterday's presentation? So it, for, for me, it depends. It depends on the amount of confidence I have in that setup. It depends on the situation that we're in, in that point in time with, with how everything's lining up. Is the market pointing in one direction? Is that group pointing in one direction? They do the, that is the edge that I have on the chart, be it the HV edge or the launch pad or the relative strength, the three of them that I covered today. If they're all pointing in the same direction, and I have the ultimate and the you know supreme confidence I've prepared. It's been on my watch list. I've been tracking it. Yes, I, I'll take that position in one go. But did that happen in year five, six, and seven? No, I would scale in because I was you know I was still developing that setup. I was still developing as a trader. I was still you know in that stage two where I wasn't really sure. That's when you could piece in. So it really depends on the phase that you're in. You can't be a Dan Dan Zanger or try to be one or try to mimic one, you know, you can't do that because those traders have been through stage one, stage two, and, and gone to stage three. You can't wake up one day and say, I want to be uh, a stage three trader. Let's skip one and two. So scale in if that's what you need to do to build your confidence. Once you build that confidence, you've seen it enough. You've seen it a hundred times. You've charted it a hundred times and, and you know that, you know, that if I, I'm going to do this on a consistent basis, I'm going to enter all at once. You, it's a journey to get there. You don't get there, uh, you know, just right away or watching some video or looking at some interview uh, or reading a blog post. So perfect. Yeah. And, and kind of along those lines, what are some kind of books and resources that, of course, you need to spend time actually trading and building that experience? But what are what are some good books and resources to kind of build that foundation 
um, that puts I, people at a so really I, good start. I have point. a bunch of them, um, and, and one that that is sort of uh, very contrary to you know the tradition of Ken Slim, Stan Weinstein, and all that. Everybody knows about you know the Darvis books, but the one that is, is in, insider buys with, uh, and I forget the fellow's name. Jesse Stein but, is that Jesse Stein? Yeah, Jesse Stein. Yeah. yeah. So insider buys by Jesse Stein. I think if you read that, it's very it's contrary and it challenges what we think is the right way to do things in the market. And it's a really good read. And I like to see the opposite side of the equation as well. So I would highly encourage you guys. I think he's on Twitter as well at Jesse Stein, but insider buys it's, it's really a, a really good book uh, that I think a lot of people, you know, there's not much attention given to it, but I think every trader should read. And then other than that, just kind of the, st the standard ones for... Yeah, I mean, the standard ones, uh, we have, you know, Market Wizard series. You could read that, you know, you can never stop reading. I personally, I think psychology matters a little bit more. So Mark Douglas's uh, book itself, you could, you know, you could read that a, you know, a couple of times and you still won't really truly understand what he's trying to say, but it, it sort of helps your psyche and, and the way you trade when you're executing. Um, another one I would say is... Uh, a lot of you know things to do with how, how can you optimize or get more productive that i think a lot of traders are not productive so that's again has nothing to do with entry tactics edges or setups or any of that stuff but productivity how do you improve your habits and lifestyle i think a lot of those type of books uh are, are far more important at a certain point in time after you read the typical uh trading books yeah so atomic habits is a favorite of yeah. mine and, and i know you've read that yep yep yeah exactly yep Perfect. Uh, getting into some questions. There's some great ones coming in and keep them coming, everybody in the chat. And thanks for all the participation. You guys have been awesome. Uh, kicking things off, um, I want to come back to the highest volume edge and kind of what a little bit what you look look for there, uh, because I, I think this is an important distinction. Do you focus on kind of the first or second highest volume gap up or does it not really matter for you when that kind of highest high volume really comes into the stock where there's already been trending for quite a while what do you prefer basically it, it so that's actually a really good question so is this the first gap after a solid base is built out if if this is you know coming out of a what traders would call a primary base right the first base after it's you know it's corrected for a couple of months or even years and we see this first burst up that sort of becomes that stage one, right? The probabilities of a stage one going, you know, up and out are far greater than if, if it's the third gap up or the fourth. If you look at UPST, I, I believe it was the fourth gap and then it crapped out completely and went, went into a massive downtrend. So usually that first one has the highest probability. The second one still has a really good probability, but when you get three or later, uh, it, it gets a little bit iffy because that's when distribution shows up and multiples don't make sense. And uh, all of that, you know, that, that other side of the market where institutions say, okay, it's time for this to base because uh, we want to liquidate this stock because it's moved way too much. So the first and the second ones are, you could have higher convictions in third is still fine before or later. It, it, it will get iffy because the market is going to get into a correction or suppress the price institutions are going to liquidate and they want to build a new base. So, yeah. Perfect. And kind of along those same lines, I think it's really important to, to cover the other side of the equation too. So after an event like this, the highest volume in over a year, what would indicate to you that that setup has failed or that characteristic is no longer valid? Um, is there some type of price action? You know, if it declines and undercuts that low, is it invalid or it fills the gap? What, what do you kind of do? So what, one thing that you want to do is you want to combine a couple of things together. So once we see this one first day uh, and we have the highest volume ever, there's still no guarantees. There's a ton of these that fail and do nothing. Uh, and the common thread within those is that the market is not in, in a good state. The market is under pressure or the group is not good enough and that this is just a one off thing and there's nobody coming back to buy some more. So what I look for is instant momentum from, from that first day's close. And I want the stock to you know, distance itself from this area because we're seeing follow on follow through volume and we're seeing you know, another day of accumulation in that same stock. So what would invalidate this particular setup? Uh, I don't really have, you know, I, I wouldn't say if the low is broken because we've seen you know, many lows break and they still work later on. And that is something that you will see but I'm trying to get involved in a very particular situation 
which is the market is good. That will increase my probabilities. The closing range on this day is greater than 50%. That tells me there's, there's consistent buying throughout that day. And then the third is that is the group good, uh, you know, working well. When I combine those three things, and, and the last question that we had was if, if this is the first or the second one coming out of that bigger base, then the probabilities of you having a six, you know, instant momentum from that area increase significantly. So try to get involved in really particular situations with this HV edge, and it will yield really good winners 20 to 30% in the span of one to five days. Perfect. And there was a really good question kind of along with that highest volume edge um, from Green Eggs, uh, basically asking, um, here, here's the question, Richard, please ask the highest volume edge on a gap up. Uh, do you try to get in after hours uh, if there's huge after hour volume or do, does Ray wait until the next day or the day after that? Basically, when do you execute after that highest right. volume edge? That depends on how much you've studied it. So if I'm a trader and I've studied this and I track post-market volume and I know that Twilio is about to report and earnings could be one reason uh, or one way that caught, you know, one way that we see a gap up in the markets. Yes. As long as you've studied that for yourself and you've proved it to yourself that you could do well and, and enter these post-market and maybe you look at volume being equal to the daily average post-market. That is something that I believe Duckman uh, does as well on Twitter. So, as it, it, that could be one way to enter on day one. And that is something that you could perfectly do. But it all comes down to have you studied it, not someone telling you to go do that and you do it and then it turns into, you know, you get the sour taste in your mouth because it's not working for you, but it's working for them. They've studied it and you have it. And if you try to mimic what they're doing, it might not work out the same way. So as long as you study it, and, and you make a you know a deliberate effort to look at these day ones, how they form and, and connect the common threads, build your own conviction in it. Yes, you can start, you can enter these day one and there's a common thread. How big is the surprise uh, on the on the sales or the the EPS? Are the estimates going up exponentially uh, or they have have they estimated? Is that a common thread? Is the amount of volume post market? Uh, equal or above the daily volume. If we see a $5 million, you know, $5 million or a dollar bar or on like a three minute, or we see, a, you know, 5 million shares come through post-market and that's above the daily average, that's a tell. And if you tie those common things together, you can enter these day one, no problem. But you, you have to do that homework uh, for yourself, see it for yourself, for you to actually do it uh, rather than someone telling you to do it, so. Yep, perfect. And I, I think later on today, uh, Scotland will be giving a, another presentation covering pretty much the exact same setup. He calls it the fish hook, which I think will be excellent. So you'll be able to hear his take and, and how he studied it as well, which should be fantastic. And um, there's a question about uh, uh, Ray, you, you said the name Ross. Ross refers to Ross Haber, who's co founder of Trailline, former PM at, at O'Neill, um, and hedge fund, hedge fund manager as well, uh, just to answer that quickly. And uh, there's a really good question um, from Ravi. Uh, TL member uh, who asks any nuances that you want to share about the launch pad setup of volume clues or slope of the moving averages, uh, where it's forming on the right side of the base, uh, anything you can talk about to go a little bit more in depth, Ray, I think would be awesome. Yeah. So the basic setup is one to 3%, the, the 10, 21 and 50 are within one to 3% of each other and price closes above them. That's, that's the first thing that you want to see. The second is, you know, this particular base, the base depth. Is it correct, you know, growth stocks tend to correct a little bit more than the general markets, that's fine. But relative to the other growth stocks, has it corrected a little bit less? Is the base depth worth, you know, 30% versus a 70, 75%? That's gonna dictate if this is a stronger stock, because if you see the RS line on a relative basis is moving to new high ground here, which, which tells me that Coupa Software has been is trying to resist the market movement, uh, which was to the downside. And that is another clue. Now you combine that launch pad that has formed with relative strength. Then you can wait for the market to come into play. Uh, that's the third piece of the puzzle. Uh, and if there are five, six, seven, or eight you know, really liquid names in this space showing the same characteristic, it's, it's about to happen, right? So when you combine those three things together, your probabilities of success are going to increase uh, significantly. So 
I would I would not isolate this particular characteristic. You use it as a piece of a bigger puzzle. Again, we want to position size well to perform in the markets. If we you know piss around and take two percent positions, there's really no point because you lack conviction and confidence in them. Perfect. And there's a question from Andrew, which I think is a good teaching moment. Uh, he basically asks uh, how to be part of the gap up on the highest volume ever gap up and not be part of the fall through. Um, I'd love to hear your take on that as well. So this day one, so there's a lot of, so, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, fascination with, I want to be the earliest as possible, be the first to enter the stock. And uh, I just want to be first because there's some amount of ego that's involved uh, with, you know, within us that wants us to do that. Um, I would focus on how can you do that? So one is, you know, a opening range breakout. A lot of traders take that first candle, use the five or the 15 minute. And if it were to reverse back up through that, they, they draw, you know, very simple line and they, and they, and, and they take that position. That could be something that you could study for yourself. For me, I, I try to keep it simple. I, you know, I, I'm studying that those methods, but I'm trying to find consistency in the markets and uh, consistency and the highest probability. So at the moment, I tend to stick to day two and after, this day one, all it tells me is there's a lot of conviction and there's a there's a buyer that wants to accumulate a certain amount of stock. Do I want to get to day day zero, the moment of earnings, the first five minutes after earnings are reported? Sure. How many traders have that proper information for earnings, sales, estimates, and the volume combined together post market? Very few even look at that. So that is something that you know as we develop deep view in the platform, it's something that I want to incorporate into that because that's something I'm going to study for myself, but I think will be beneficial for others. So I want to get to that day zero and transition to that day zero or the first five minutes with solid evidence so that again, it all comes down to position sizing it well. If you, I took a 3% position and I'm up 20%, that's not going to do anything to your equity curve in the grand scheme of things. Might make you feel good because you're up 20%, but it's not making a significant difference or a meaningful difference to the amount of income you're going to get from the markets. Yeah. And you don't want to try to guess before earnings and enter because you think it might gap up that that's not a winning proposition. That's not, that's not an edge that you can play out. Um, yeah. And Ray, you've got a note here on the chart about follow through volume the next day. Um, so I'd love to hear how important that is for you to, to see that, you know, add on volume, sustained interest. And also, uh, I think Tesla back in 2019 is another good example of really strong yeah. fall through volume. So the institutions weren't just coming in that first day, but they really wanted to accumulate shares. Even that second day, I think it was even higher volume than that first first gap up. So yeah, uh, yeah. The, the second day will really tell you, and especially the the scenario that I like is the stock's gapped up and it's visible accumulation. Uh, everybody in the market just knows clear as day that this has happened. Sales are good, they revise estimates, blah, 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 all that. But that second day, if the market opens down on the session and this name just gets scooped up completely on any weakness, that's a tell that, okay, now this is gonna, this is gonna go. Uh, and, and, and you know, whoever accumulated that first day is gonna accumulate that, you know, has come back for some more. So that particular instance, if the market were to gap down that next day, the stock sees a little bit of pressure, but at the open just surges up and through this high volume close, that's a good tell for me. And, and you combine that with volume, usually that's a bidding proposition uh, to the upside. So I'm looking for subtle clues after the gap. It doesn't exhibit enough relative strength after the, you know, is, is evidence still building and is it still convincing me to put my hard earned capital back into that name so that I can get a return. If it's doing that, then I'm putting my money in and placing my bets accordingly. Yeah. The kind of logic behind the setup is, you know, something has shifted in the minds of large institutions where, yeah. you know, something new came out, uh, they can update their models. The stock is valued much higher than what it's at right now. And basically they can't go out and build their position in one day. So that huge gap up is is brought on by that first accumulation by institutions. And then that trend that we can trade as, as retail traders is brought on because over the course of the next few weeks, few months even, they have to slowly build and build and build their positions because they can't just go in all at once. That would just, you know, completely mess up the chart and, and you know, they'd, they'd raise their costs way too much. So um, that's kind of the, 
the market dynamic that's at play, the supply and demand um, dynamic behind that setup. Um, and Ray, I and want if anybody's to, wondering, yeah. all these slides from every presentation will be available. We'll be making like a, a free course on the Trader Line website. You'll be able to log in, review all these applications, uh, Laura, these presentations, and and have them as a resource forever, and they'll be absolutely free. So, yep, perfect. And um, Ray, I'd love to hear you chat about you know mastering a setup and and also kind of jack of all trades, master of none, that type of thing, like focusing on one thing, mastering it before moving on to, to another, you know, setup, entry tactic, all that. So I think, I think that's important because it, again, it builds confidence and, and we're, we're really nothing in the market without confidence. If we can't go out and, and convince ourselves that we could find a hundred, 200, 300 instances of what we're looking for in the future or at the moment in the markets, then it really doesn't matter uh, because at that point, again, we can't we can't do what we want. What we want to do is make a large sum of money. But to do that, we have to really have conviction in in that particular you know setup that we're looking for. So, and the only way you could do it, you go historically look for these things again and again. Try to you know build that visual memory. We're paid to you know make a decision in the market at a very particular time. That's when we take a trade. That's what a trade is. We're making. We're making a very particular and deliberate decision based on our confidence in a particular outcome in the markets. So the more we study that, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be HVs or launch pads or relative strength. It could be anything that you study. You can study interest rates for that matter and what happens when they rise. And if you do a study on that and you know and you've done your homework on it, the amount of confidence you'll have in that, you know, when the market does that will be far greater than any other trader. Because again, at the end of the day, as much as we want to get along, we're competing against other people and someone has to lose for you to win a, a large sum. So if you do your homework and, and you make a deliberate effort to, to really have these on paper and, and do them yourselves, you'll be, you know, better than X amount of traders out there. And that's how, you know, that's really uh, all that hard work that you put in will, will show uh, on your equity curves. Perfect. And just a quick thank you to, to everybody asking fantastic questions and also the TL members in the chat. Thanks for uh, all those line emojis as well. And uh, Ray, I want to ask you, you know, we've covered, you know, the, the kind of buy side of the equation, but in terms of sell rules, what's kind of your, your rule of thumb? You know, obviously it's different in a trending market versus a market that's a little bit more volatile as well during a correction. So sell rules for me, if I'm operating from a state that uh, I want to go back to a particular slide here. Just give me one second. This slide. So if I'm operating from a certain state where I've made progress and the market's making me feel good because I've done well and everything's working, uh, now I have a baseline to operate upon. So if this is, let's say this is $100,000 and you've gone up to $150,000, right? Now you've made $50,000, you know, you, that, that's the aggregate sum you've made. Now for me, uh, I don't celebrate until I take money out of the markets uh, and I draw it as an income. And the, that is the, the real way, you know, that's, that's real progress that you're making. When you see that check or that wire hit back and, and that's, you know, the fruits of your labor. So I'm not celebrating until I'm doing that. So if I make progress now, this is my baseline. Uh, I don't want, you know, whatever it is, this is my new hundred K baseline. I want to make sure I don't breach that. And I listen to the market when I'm coming in. So that, that is sort of how I approach the lo losing equation. Am I going to get the exact top? Am I going to catch 104% the full move of UBSD? Probably not. Uh, and is that my goal? Sure, it could be. Is it realistic? Probably not. So I'm trying to catch you know a chunk of the move. I will sell some into strength. Uh, and, and then raise my stops very quickly. Or if I were to take a loss, I, I try to limit it to 2%. So I'm very deliberate in what I'm doing in the markets. It's either going to work for me or it's going to stop me out at 2%. And when it works for me, it has to work for me in a big way so that I can you know get 10, 15, 20% out of that name. And then when I lose and, and the market frustrates me, which happens and is perfectly fine. And you can probably see it here where you give, you made progress, but you give all of it back. And it happens often. Uh, it, so that from, you know, from that perspective, I'm taking quicker losses 
and I'm waiting for that one big win that's going to ride me all the way up in a very short span of time to get me away from this, you know, the, the previous baseline that I've set for myself. So you'll hear this again over the, you know, the next few days and next weekend with, with many different presentations, but it's really when, when you're wrong, you have to take it to the chin and accept, you know, accept that with the HV edge, if you deploy that and you hit, you know, if I hit a loser and I lose 2% on that aim, it's going to happen. But if I do that over a span of 10 trades and it's happening 10 out of 10 times, then I don't have an edge in the markets. And that's really what it means. So you're going to have churn in moments. You're going to have market environments like this one that we've had for a while now um, where thing, things are not going to work for you. The th same things that you did two years ago, five years ago may not work in this market. That's more to do with the market environment than it does with your edge. So that when you're developing those tactics, you have to look at in what situations are they working and in what situations they, they don't work. And when they aren't working, you just have to you know take it to the chin, reduce your ego a little bit and just be on the sidelines. And that's what this is showing is when you have a flat equity curve and you're not making much progress, you're just on the sidelines looking at an opportunity that you've, you know that you will see that will you know cause this rise in your equity curve. And um, for 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 and in terms of concrete um, sell rule, you look for kind of two closes below the twenty one EMA. Um, usually, you know, in a trending market, right? Yeah. So I guess we could uh, flip to like a really particular example uh, that I think that would sort of crystallize uh, the point rather mm -hmm. than talking basics. So, for example, we see AXSM. Right. This is a, a recent chart. I don't know if you see my charts. Let yep. me know if you do. Yep. TC um, so th this particular volume was was the highest in over a year and possibly, you know, over a year. And, I, and I've traded this name back in 2019. And I think it had massive news with $50 million worth of volume. And the stock went from about $9 to uh, 100, three figures. You could go back and, and, and take a look at that. So that's connecting a past state where I traded this name on very similar type of situation and connecting it to this particular state. So that's the first thing that I see. So if I were to enter this name, uh, I'm trying to, uh, you know, I'm trying to box in my risk uh, to, to less than 2% as best as I can. So if I were to enter through this HVC and the stock comes back in and stops me out, I take that loss. And, and that's, you know, in a sequence of trades, uh, it, it, you know, in a sequence of trades, it's going to work. In a span of, you know, if I do this 10 times, it might work five or six out of those 10 times, those four times I'm ready to take it to the chin and take that loss. So I'm trying to limit my drawdown after I have an edge to about two, two to, you know, two and a half, three percent. Again, it also depends on the volatility of the name as well. So I'm trying to combine those aspects and take, you know, risk accordingly, but I try to limit it to 2% uh, in my current trading at the moment. Perfect. And I want to ask you about, you know, when you notice a theme, of a certain edge or a certain certain entry tactic working, do you then kind of try to focus solely on that because that's kind of the, you know, what what the market's recognizing at that at that instant? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, what we've seen is a lot of oil and gas. Uh, you know, after April, uh, oil and gas was doing pretty well, and I see saw those coming up in my HDF. So they were moving a hundred percent in less than six weeks. A lot of the smaller names right. will give you higher beta and alpha. So maybe the HDF setup is working a little bit better and your HDF, my watch list that I track will, you know, have, will have a lot more stocks than my gappers watch list at the moment. So that tells me that, you know, biotechs at the moment are hot and they've moved up a hundred, you know, many biotechs have moved up a hundred percent in less than six weeks. That is a theme I want to be involved in. So the, the watch list that I have sort of tell me, uh, you know, this is more populated than this one or this the IPOs are working well, then the IPO watch list is going to be more populated than any other watch list. So. Perfect. And can you talk a little bit about the watch list and how you organize it and, and why you've got these three watch lists in, in the first place? Sure. So um, I, I basically keep, keep track of three. The gappers will tell me the HV edge. So any anything that gaps up in the market, uh, I, I tend to keep track of. So when LNTH gapped up, it would make my watch list here. I feel that is sort of the first step. You have to get it on your radar. You have to see it for you to actually trade it. Right. I don't tend to look at, you know, intraday 
uh, what is up the most with the biggest amount of volume. I feel like that's best used when you're when you're a day trader. So uh, I keep this particular watch list just to track the HV edge. One that we can point out is Chewy. This is the highest volume ever on June 22. Something happened on this particular day that cost 49 million in volume with a high closing range. Yes, it's in a downtrend, but the story, news, upgrade, something, something's happened at this point in time that's caused the this volume and for it to gap up. We see, you know, steady accumulation. And then this day particularly gaps above the 30 spot and then goes up for a good run, about a 50% run in a very short amount of time. How does it start? This is really the start, right? I'm not buying here, 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 because there's no certainty in what's happening. It's still in the downtrend. But on this particular day is when it would make your watch list. That's the first step. You get it to your watch list, then your probabilities of trading it increase quite a bit. And then, you know, even then you, there are no guarantees, but there might be a way that you could enter this stock so that you could get a portion of that 50% move. The second one I have, this one I've picked up, uh, I would say from Mike, is to maintain an IPO watch list. A lot of young stocks when the market is risk on will uh, double uh, and do really well in a very short span of time. So risk appetite for young stocks equals a good market. Right. And when I see my IPO watches, there's so many that I can't even keep track of them. That tells me that the market's good and that will play into my psyche and that will play into my position size. And the third one, um, Leif uh, is, uh, I think, the 2019 U.S. investing champion. He's really the expert at this. Uh, if you want to we'll go watch uh, the presentation from last year, and I think he'll be on this year as well, um, is the HDF. And what, what themes are working in the market? You'll see a lot of biotechs if you keep track of stocks, 100% moves in less than six weeks. These biotechs are moving and making massive, massive moves. And this watch list will tell me the theme. When the oil and gas stocks were doing well and, and you know, really moving up to, up to you know, doubling less than six weeks, we had a ton of oil and gas. That's the first step. You have to get it on your watch list for you to even have a chance to, to be participating in these massive moves. So these are the three sort of key watch lists that I maintain. And then I make a focus list out of these three. And, and again, it's about probabilities being, being in a bidding situation. And I slowly focus on these three watch lists. And it gives me, you know, I can extract a really good income on a yearly basis, just focusing it, you know, in on these and being in a bidding situation. Perfect. Great. We're, we're coming in on, on time here. So just one last question, where can people learn more about your style, your methods, all of that, um, and the tools you use as well? So I, I'm basically on Twitter. Uh, a lot of work that I do is, uh, you know, traderline.com as well. Uh, I, I run a mentorship service as well called uh, TraderLine Private Access, which we started about two years ago, and now we have over 1,100 traders. Uh, and the goal of that is, again, to build a lot of these concepts that are covered today is to give you that foundation, build your routines. I sort of see it as a one to two year program where you come in, we solidify, you know, your foundation and you get out the door. We don't want you to stick around. So that's sort of what private access is. I love, you know, collaborating with traders, Oliver Kell. Now, Stan Weinstein project, I think is, is very huge. And um, so, you know, making an impact on that that side of things and then also uh, hopefully, we'll, you know, in fall this year, we'll be releasing a platform that, that will be disruptive and that will question, you know, it, it will be cost effective, it will be efficient, it will be fast, and it will give you the data that you need to make quality decisions in the market. Uh, and, and really, tools and data should not be the core of the, you know, the problem. It should be you have the data, you have the tools, now you just focus on your decision making. And that is what our goal is with DeepView. Yeah, and there, there's a question earlier about you know what scanner can look for the highest volume ever, and we'll we'll have some easy to use screens to, to look for these specific edges that you talked about. Awesome. Yep. Perfect. So we'll leave it there. Any last advice for everybody watching, Ray, as they go on? Yeah, I mean, I would say my key takeaway, like just on the closing thoughts, you have to be a doer. You have to get your hands dirty. You have to do this for yourself. You can listen. You could watch presentations, and you could do all of that. That's good. You could be receptive to information, but if you actually go out there. And, and find 50 examples of the higher low setup from Patrick Walker, find relative strength examples that Joe Fami pointed out, find the highest volume examples, 
for yourself and you get your hands dirty, you'll get there from stage one and two to stage three a lot quicker than just listening and trying to mimic them or follow them. But actually, it's the real learning is in the doing. Perfect. We'll leave it there, everybody. Thanks so awesome. much for tuning in. And uh, in just a quick few minutes, we'll have Jim Ropel, who I'm sure everybody's looking forward to. And uh, we'll be right back at around 1045 Eastern time. So stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll see you there. Thank you.